Let's turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. We're in the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount. And I'm just going to touch on a couple of these as we have time this evening. <clears throat> we have looked at an introductory, uh, two introductory messages actually here so far. Uh, in, on the Sermon on the Mount, kind of the setting of it, and then we got into what is the blessing that the Lord is talking about, and we looked at the first four of these characteristics. And so let me just give briefly that background again by reading Matthew 5, 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. There he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Then, finally, the last two verses, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So we saw uh, this last time that, uh, well, two, really two times ago, the blessing corresponds to the favor or privilege or um, grace, the, the gift of God, the transcendent happiness that God provides to those who are in these situations. And I made the case that, and I hope that it was helpful to you, I made the case that the blessing was not just a future blessing, okay? Think of this this way. Blessed are, not blessed will be, all of these cases. So it's not just the end outcome that is viewed as a blessing, but it is the present circumstance of a person who is poor in spirit, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, merciful, uh, pure in heart, and so on and so forth. That idea of blessing is not an idea of good luck or merely of a good outcome, although there is a good outcome for these ones, but it is the idea of a present as well as a future blessing for God's people. And so then we began to look at eight character traits of godly people. Jesus speaks of these virtues and pronounces a blessing from God upon people who are marked by these virtues. And I started out with poor in spirit. Poor in spirit. If you are poor in spirit, yours will be the kingdom of heaven. And immediately I connected this poverty in spirit with John chapter 3 because it says theirs is the kingdom of heaven in this location, and there in John 3, Jesus says, if you are born again, then you will be able to see the kingdom of God. But unless a man is born again, if he's not, then is, then he will not be able to see the kingdom. So I correlated being poor in spirit with being born again, and that's really the reality of this. These characteristics are spiritual characteristics. They're not physical characteristics like monetary poverty. No, this is spiritual poverty, uh, not mourning over lost loved ones or sadness of things in this life, but mourning over sin and so on, okay? So poor in spirit, connected to being born again. So all these character traits are those of believers. And whether you're a pastor like I am or a person in the church, a member of the church, you need to consider that these characteristics should mark your life. One of the issues that we looked at, too, in our introduction to this section of Scripture was, how does this connect to us as Christians? Now, you may never have heard this before, but there are some who say that the Sermon on the Mount is not really to be preached in the church. It's not relevant to the church. It's the kingdom uh, constitution, and so we're not in the kingdom. Um, it has to, it's, law, it's connected to the law, and so since the church is a parenthesis in God's program, all of this stuff kind of just, you know, was given back here by the Lord, and the church is this parenthesis, and this stuff just kind of jumps right over the church, and it becomes irrelevant for us. I disagree with that view quite strenuously because 
because, not because I've turned into a Reformed theologian and think that there's a kind of flatness to the revelation of God, but rather I object to that view because the Scriptures are clear that we as believers are citizens of God's kingdom. We're not in it right now, just like maybe you're a, a citizen of another country, but you're not in that country right now. You know, I'm a citizen of the United States, and I'm in the United States. But maybe when I'm overseas in, a, in a, uh, Argentina, uh, I say, well, I'm a citizen of the U.S., even though I'm not there right now. Well, the same thing with us. We're Christians, but we're not in the kingdom of which we are citizens. And so because we are citizens of that kingdom, you can't just take the, the revelation of Jesus and you know, jump it over this you know, new thing called the church that was revealed in the New Testament. No, it's actually that the character traits that he shows in this sermon are those that mark all Christians in this age of grace. They should, it should mark us, and increasingly so, precisely because we are citizens of that future kingdom. And I don't have to, I hope, labor too long to make that point or drive it home, but I can say, for instance, um, in Acts chapter 14, around 21 and 22, the Apostle Paul tells the people that he's ministering to there in Asia Minor, look, he says, through many tribulations, we will enter the kingdom. We're not in there yet. And Jesus tells the disciples to pray that the kingdom of God will come. So we are looking forward to a kingdom. We know that it's going to take some tribulation to enter into that kingdom. Yet, if you look at Romans chapter 14, Paul is able to say to the Roman Christians there, Romans 14 and verse 17, For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So therefore, verse 15 is true, that we're not to grieve our brothers because of our food, because we're no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with food the one for whom Christ died. So we're not to make a big issue about these doubtful matters or these matters of, of liberty, as people call them, um, because our lives are guided by the principles of kingdom righteousness. So just, again, to say it one more time, maybe differently, we're not in the kingdom, which comes after the church and the tribulation. We're not in that kingdom yet, but our lives are fashioned by kingdom ethics, now, okay, that's the connection. We are sons of the kingdom, so we ought to act like it. We are sons of the kingdom, so we ought to act like it. And that's why this sermon is eminently applicable to Christians today. So we must be poor in spirit. That should mark our conduct, our thoughts about ourselves and towards others. And if that's the case, then we will enjoy the kingdom of heaven. And that kingdom of heaven, remember, is something that we inherit as believers. We also enter it as believers. Inheriting and entering are essentially synonymous. When you think about it, by the way, when you, if, if you inherit the kingdom, what does that mean to inherit something? It doesn't just mean to be, like, placed next to it, or even in the case of the kingdom, sat in it. It means to enjoy the blessings of that kingdom. To inherit the kingdom, like, you know, to inherit your long-lost uncle's fortune, is not just to, oh, well, that's nice, the bank account has a lot of zeros after it. No, it's to be able to enjoy, you know, the things that he uh, provided to you in that inheritance. And so it is with the kingdom that we will be able to enjoy the kingdom of heaven. Secondly, blessed are those who mourn. We should be people who mourn over our sin. Not be happy about it, like the Corinthian church was proud that they had a sinful member in their church. They were to be ashamed and to put that person out of the church, to mourn over their sin, to show godly sorrow, to exhibit godly repentance over their sin. They were to be ones who mourned over their sin. I ask you this question, do you mourn over your sin? Is it something that bothers you? If it doesn't bother you, then I have a concern for your soul. 
I'm not saying that it's got to bother you like, you know, to the point of what depression and uh, despair and, and uh, wanting to give up on life and all of that sort of thing. You ought to be able to deal with that bother by going to the Lord in confession and being cleansed and thank God for that and be then thus lifted up out of the despair that you would be driven into if all you had was your sin and all you had was the, the, the mourning over that sin. Uh, you should be able to experience a measure of this comfort that verse 4 talks about. Now, ultimately, we mourn over sin in our personal lives and in our society, but we will be delivered from that in the end. In the kingdom and in the, in the eternal kingdom, the heavenly state, we will be delivered from sin, and there will be no more sorrow, no more sighing, no more crying, no more sin to mourn over. And there are little snatches of that comfort that we can enjoy in this life. When you realize that Christ died for your sins to pay for them and loose you from them and forgive you from them so that you don't have to you know, think that you can mourn over your sins in such a way that you're going to um, be able to atone for them by being sad enough. You cannot do that. Not possible. So we're poor in spirit. Christians mourn over their sin. We're meek in our character, verse number five. We're meek, we're gentle, we're lowly. Uh, we're reasonable people, humble, considerate. And these type of people will inherit the earth. Again, inherit the earth basically means the same thing as inherit the kingdom. I made the case last time that this is not a two-level system where some get the kingdom of heaven and other lower people get the earth. That's not the case at all. In fact, we're very greatly mistaken if we think of heaven and earth as two like separate realms in the far future. The new Jerusalem comes down and is where? On the new earth. And God's people dwell with him there on the new earth. So when we say heaven, we ought to be thinking new earth, not just some place up in the starry sky floating on clouds and all that sort of thing. So they're not two different places for the people of God. Perish the thought that the Jewish people get the earth and the Christians get heaven, or that the 144,000 get heaven, and the rest of you know, the peons, so to, speak, so to speak, get the earth. That's not the case. There's not a two-level system. There's a, gr a glorious unity amongst the peoples of God in the eternal state, but we digress. The point is, blessed are the meek, those who are considerate and sympathetic and gentle and humble. They will inherit the earth. They're contrasted in Psalm 37 with the wicked. Okay, so this is really in a sense opposite of wickedness. Wicked people are not meek. Now they might present externally as if they are, but they are not. And those who are meek will find that future blessing of inheriting the earth. Number four, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness as the deer pants for the water. So my soul longs after you, O oh God. You want to get up in the morning, like we alluded to in Psalm 57, and awaken the morning with your praise to God? That's the moving, a moving notion. Try it sometime when you wake up before the sun rises. And as the sun rises, begin the day with praise to God. And say with the psalmist, I will awaken the dawn with my praise. Because God is worthy, my friends. God is worthy. And he's worthy of, of our seeking him and hungering and thirsting for righteousness. So sin, then, must be starvation if righteousness is something you hunger and thirst for. You with me? Sin is like being starved. Righteousness is like being filled after a wonderful meal at the table in your home. A blessing on those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. That blessing is, in the end, they will be filled. But again, like with comfort, there will be snatches of that filling all along the way so that we don't just experience the filling once at the end, but we enjoy it as we go on in life. We can greatly enjoy the filling of of righteousness and, and observing God's work in us over the years. 
Number five, those who are merciful are blessed. Those who are merciful are blessed. The merciful are those who are concerned about others in need. They're sympathetic. They're compassionate to them. A heavenly wisdom is that which demonstrates mercy. Remember the wisdom that is from above is first pure and peaceable and full of mercy and good fruits, James 3.17 says. The, the wisdom that's from below is, is evil, it's sensual, it's demonic. But that which is from above is merciful. The blessing upon such people, and again, this has to mark our, our character. Christians are merciful people. If you're not merciful, then you have a hole in your holiness. You have a, something you're missing in your life. And so you must com- cultivate that, that idea of mercy. Uh, some of us are very zealous people, you know, and uh, we're kind of like, um, well, like zealous reminds me of Simon the Zealot or, or Peter. You know, we kind of default to uh, take out the sword and whack off somebody's ear instead of just be merciful, you know. Be nice, be compassionate, be sympathetic, be patient. The blessing on those who are merciful is that they will obtain mercy themselves. And this is what we all need, whether we know it or not. Desperately we need it because sinners do not deserve the mercy of God. Go to James chapter 2 and 13, if you would, please. James chapter 2 and verse number 13. This verse will get you every time. In James 2.13, the Bible says this, For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment, but judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Reminds me of the story that Jesus told of the man who was forgiven a huge debt, then he wouldn't forgive the small debt of his companion, and the, the king or his lord, his master, brought him back in and said, hey, why, why are you acting like this? And he, sh- and he really gave it to him, really punished him because of his lack of mercy toward his friend and lack of exercise and the kind of forgiveness that he himself had received. Mercy is extended to those who have shown mercy. Christians will naturally be those who show mercy toward others. We in our sin stand in need of mercy in a similar way that someone who is in physical distress needs mercy from those who are around them and that that mercy that is appropriate to their situation. So be careful to think of mercy. Blessed are you if you're merciful. You will obtain mercy. And I know you want that mercy. Be merciful to others to demonstrate that you are like God. God's mercy is high as the heavens, isn't it? higher than the clouds, deeper than the deepest ocean. And so we should draw from that reserve of mercy and be able to exercise that toward others. Uh, Number six, I think it is, uh, blessed are the pure in heart, verse eight. Why? For they shall see God. What is it to be pure in heart? To the pure, the Bible says, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, because their minds and consciences are defiled. The pure in heart are those who are clean, who are free from guilty activity, guilty intentions, and guilty hopes and guilty desires. They are those who have pure desires. Perfectly? Question mark? No. Impossible. A noticeable level of purity and growing level of purity? Most certainly. That's what we must have. Think of that verse, to the pure, all things are pure. You've probably been around worldly people who can turn any thought, any phrase, any conversation to something that's distasteful, that's sinful, that's innuendo or some kind of thing because their minds are in the gutter. That's the idea. Their minds are impure. We don't want to have minds like that. We want to have minds, if anything, that are, that are naively innocent, that you know, maybe totally just miss the connection of something that was said to some evil thing 
because we're not thinking like that. But you young people watch this in your life. You will see as you have interaction with others out in the world that this will be something that will come up. And you want to have a pure heart, a heart that is full of good desires, not defiling desires. And the pure in heart are blessed because not only are they pure in heart, that's the present part of the blessing, but in the future they shall see God. Now, people have used this notion of seeing God as a way to kind of pry or lever the Scriptures against themselves. And so they'll say, look, you know, what does it mean, see God? Nobody's seen God, the Bible says. And they kind of act like, well, when the Bible says no one has seen God, that nobody will see God. That's not true. The Bible is very clear in the book of Revelation that we will see God. Revelation 22, his servants will serve him and they will see his face. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith right now, but we will walk by what? Sight. We will walk by sight in the future. We will see God. God is good to those who are pure in heart, Psalm 73, 10 says. And we will see his face. Jesus did say in John 1, 18, no one has seen the Father except the Son. He's the one who explains the Father. But that's because in our sinfulness, we cannot see the unveiled glory of God in its fullness without being fried, I call it, without being zapped. And people who even saw the back of God or uh, uh, the, the angel of the Lord or some manifestation of God often thought that they would die because they saw God. That's reverence, my friends. That's purity in heart. But those who are pure in heart, they will see God. All right, what number are we on now? Uh, is it number seven now? Blessed are those who are peacemakers. Peacemakers. For they shall be called the sons of God. I understand peacemakers to be those who reconcile uh, people to each other. Those who are having difficulties between themselves are in need of somebody to come in between and bring them together, to bring party A and party B together and help them. Evangelists bring peace between God and his enemies through the gospel. That's kind of a peacemaker. Although God has established the terms of the peace, at least this evangelist is bringing people into the recognition of what those terms are. Pastors may help family members reconcile or church members reconcile. They are in this group of peacemakers as well, or should be. They must teach the warring parties how forgiveness works and why they need to exhibit it. They must show what love is and how to exercise it. These are, this is what reconcilers or peacemakers do. They bring peace. They use their wisdom to bring peace to cir circumstances. The blessing of being a peacemaker is that all such people will be called the sons of God. You know, again, don't read this as if, okay, if I make enough peace, then I will get to become a son of God. No, rather, those who are born again, poor in spirit, mourning over sin, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, who are merciful, who are pure in heart, demonstrating the work of God in their lives, they will be also peacemakers, and they will be blessed not only in the present giving of peace to others, but also because they will be called the sons of God. And why is that? What does a son of God mean? In this case, it means somebody who takes on the characteristics of the Father. Somebody who is a reflection of the image of the Father, who looks like God in their conduct, in their thinking, in how they interact with others. In this case, those who make peace are like God, because God is himself a peacemaker. He works to reconcile people to himself and shows us how to be reconciled to one another. I believe that this is connected to our faith in Christ and how we get people to become, come at peace with God, and that is by faith in the Lord. 
Jesus didn't say that here, but, and that's partly because, you know, the revelation wasn't completed yet. You didn't have Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection done yet very early in his ministry, uh, like we would say today. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will become one who is poor in spirit and mourn and a peacemaker and so on and so forth. You will have those other attributes. And then finally, tonight, uh, the Lord gives us one more that we might wish was not in this passage of Scripture, but it is, and that is verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Why? Because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Being lightly opposed for the sake of the gospel can hardly be called persecution. Your friends telling you no thanks is not persecution. Um, We're talking about active, hard persecution here. It's not just about people who argue against the gospel or or call you a name because you're a Christian. That would be very light, you know, persecution, if you will, but not really this kind of thing that we're talking about. Those who revile you and call you evil and try to harm you and close your church or put a fence around your church, try to make you pay fines and things like that, put you in jail, everything like that. Though That is persecution. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Think of this, in some special measure, those are brothers and sisters who are in jail right now in foreign countries are going to be specially blessed because theirs will be the kingdom of heaven. They will have, as low as they've gone, they, like Joseph, will be elevated out of prison into the place of prominence in the kingdom of God. How I thank God for that. We won't be, we won't be jealous of their position in that kingdom. You know what? We will recognize these people suffered martyrdom, imprisonment, stripes, tortures, deprivation. Even now today, I just watched a video, uh, what, two nights ago was it, about Christianity being persecuted? Christianity is the most persecuted religion in the world. Do you remember that? Do you know that? Nobody talks about that. It's not on the nightly news. Christians are the most persecuted religious sect in the world. Why is that? You know, why do people want to close churches, but I, I wonder if they want to close mosques as much as they do churches, and so on. I just wonder. But that's interesting to me, Christianity most persecuted. And you don't hear about it. Of course, there are others who are persecuted for their religious beliefs. We don't say, woe is us, because we're the only ones, but... I say us because we feel a sense of kindred spirit with those who are, those who suffer under the oppression of such persecutors. They, like the poor in spirit, will inherit the kingdom of heaven, which is one and the same with the kingdom of God. Those who have been persecuted will receive more than the equivalent of everything they've lost and then some. Remember Peter when he said to the Lord, look, we've left everything? And Jesus said, look, when when you come into the kingdom, you'll you'll receive a hundred times more than that. The affliction of persecution will appear to be light in the view of the glory that they will receive. In this way, these ones can rejoice and be glad because they have a great reward in heaven. There's no doubt in my mind that God has a special place in his heart, so to speak, for those who have endured such trouble from evildoers. They will be rewarded richly. Can you imagine the comfort that they will experience after the sorrow of suffering in heaven, in the kingdom? The world says, blessed are those who are confident. Blessed are those who are bold. Blessed are those who are wealthy and powerful. Blessed are those who are fulfilled. Blessed are those who follow their hearts. Blessed are those who are quote-unquote good But not so the Lord Jesus Christ. The eight traits of character proclaimed by Jesus are descriptions of what a person looks like when he repents for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's really the issue I want to connect. What he's saying here is 
when he starts in 417 preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he is trying to build a bunch of people who look like the Beatitudes say. He's trying to say, this is what the repentant life looks like. And that's why it's important for us as Christians to say, look, this morality does not just jump over us and go to the next age. This morality is our morality. This is the morality of those who repent of their sin. And we are those people who have repented of our sin. When a person comes into a right relationship with the king, he is blessed in all of these ways, even if he's persecuted. And at the same time, these traits are checkpoints for us to see how we are living before the Lord. Are we living rightly before God? Checkpoint, poverty in spirit. Checkpoint, mourning over sin. Checkpoint, are we meek? Check yourself. Do you hunger and thirst for righteousness or do you just don't care? Checkpoint. Are you merciful? Are you pure in heart? Are you a peacemaker? And do you suffer persecution for God or are you willing to? That will tell you how your repentance looks to God. John the Baptist said, bear fruits worthy of repentance. That's what we need to do as well today. Let us pray. God in heaven, as we close our service, I pray that you will help us with these checkpoints. Lord, not that we earn our salvation by no means. We, we understand that very well. But yet we know that we're responsible to carry out the activity of the Christian life faithfully before you, and you have used the word of God here to help us to check ourselves and make sure we're walking on the straight and narrow path and not veering off into the broad and destructive path. Lord, so keep us, help us to exhibit our true repentance with these attributes. Help us, Lord, in our spirits to be poor and merciful, to be meek and mourning, to hunger and thirst for righteousness, to be merciful and pure, and to be peacemakers. And should we suffer persecution, help us do so with grace and know that ours is the kingdom of heaven. And even in the midst of the persecution, we'll be blessed by you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I hope that's helpful. Next time, salt and light. And we're going to learn a little bit more about salt and light in the uh, upcoming verses, 5, 13, 14, and, and so on, down through verse 20 or so, where the Lord talks about the purpose of the law and the purpose of his coming in relation to that law. So we uh, say thank you for participating tonight. We're going to bring our service to a close. Uh, those that are here are going to enjoy a few moments of fellowship, and perhaps if you're online and you think of someone or God brings someone to mind tonight or tomorrow, uh, I always encourage you, if, if that person's brought to mind, uh, pick up the phone and dial the number. Send a text message. Send an email. Send a note in the mail. Let them know you're thinking of them, praying for them, and thus the body of Christ will minister to itself and demonstrate these character traits that we've seen here in the Sermon on the Mount. May God bless you and keep you, my friends. Have a good night. Amen.